So what I want to do now is I really want to go through the full analysis of one voxel. As I said, we would then repeat this at every single voxel with exactly the same procedure, but I just want to go step by step to show you what happens in one single voxel. So here's the experiment. The data that we have are one run from one participant. So as I said, also known as a first level analysis. So this means I started a sequence. I started acquiring both data. My participant engaged in some task. And then maybe 10 minutes later, I stopped the sequence. And I gave my participant a break before going on to the next run. So before starting again the sequence and having my participant again engage uh, in some uh, cognitive task of interest. Now the, um, the type of experiment that, um, that we are doing in this imaginary case is uh, a very simple block design. Uh, in fact, it's 16 seconds of viewing pictures of faces and 16 seconds of viewing just scrambled images. So the design looks somewhat like this with each of these block uh, each of these blocks um, pointing to when um, pointing to when uh, pictures of faces were presented were presented. Um, we just happen to have a TR of two and a TE of thirty. Um, and finally, we are going to be concerned, as I said, with one voxel, voxel fifteen, nineteen, eighteen, which happens to be in right posterior temporal cortex. And in fact, here is the uh, time series of that voxel. And now the crucial question, which is what we are trying to address with a statistical approach, does this voxel care about pictures of faces? In other words, is the variance in this voxel associated with the onset and offset of the task? So let's look at this from the lens of a general linear model. Um, so here's our expression. And really, as I showed earlier, Y is nothing but the time series of our voxel. And X obviously is the onset and offset, is our experimental design, the onset and offset of, the ta of our task of interest. And of course, in this case, I'm making it very simple. I'm just assuming there's no other uh, regressor of interest or non-interest. So here it is. And the first problem we have is what is the correct uh, regressor to have in uh, the X matrix? See, to go one step back, uh, here, what this is saying, these lines are marking the onset and duration of uh, our task of interest. Then sort of this is our baseline, then again, task of interest, then again, baseline. And the first question we have to address is, what is the shape of the brain response to uh, 16 seconds of a task? Okay. So the very basic analysis would say, okay, so here's the, here's the onset and then offset and onset and offset. And we would just say, okay, how, how well um, uh, are the data related to the onset and offset? And we could run a regression exactly like this uh, with this sort of, uh, as it's known, a boxcar regressor that codes the response of the brain to each event. And so if we did this, I'm, I'm marking in yellow sort of visually what would be the error. And you can, you can, you can, uh, you can derive uh, the value of beta, its variance, and then you can, um, you can make a t-test out of it. And so just putting in relation this voxel, the time series of this voxel to this sort of blocky onset and offset already gives us um, a significant t-test. But the question is, is this the shape of how you expect the brain to respond when um, it engages in some process of interest? Do you expect the bold response to you know, be flat and then suddenly to be triggered, boom, come right up, then in this blocky fashion, stay up and then come down back to baseline rather quickly and then sort of be flat again. Is this what you expect the brain to do in terms of the hemodynamic 
response function. And, and, and obviously that can't be the case. The brain is doing something a little smoother. If you remember from our first lectures where we were talking about um, the, um, the physiology of the bold response, it's, it's more of a smooth, the response to some kind of stimulation is more of a smooth rising and sort of peaking and then falling. It's something closer to this. So what we typically do, we don't do the analysis expecting the brain to turn on and off this way in this kind of boxcar regression fashion. We typically convolve our onsets and offsets with some smooth function. For example, with a Gaussian, which is what you're seeing here. So if you convolve those onsets and offsets, that, that, that boxcar with a Gaussian, you get something that looks more like this, which is much closer and much more reasonable as an expectation to what the brain would do if you present it with a stimulus. And indeed, if you just look at the difference between the two, you can tell that we're reducing the amount of visual error, the amount of yellow, in other words. And indeed, if you look at the t-test, we have now uh, greatly increased the, the magnitude of the effect, which went from 150 to 267. And we have also decreased the amount of variance. So overall, our t-test has more than doubled. But, but this also leads us to think, okay, well, is Gaussian fine? Well, there are a number of different ways, uh, different approaches we could take. Um, a lot of people today tend to use the so-called double gamma function. And it's not quite as easy to see here. Here, I can flip through the Gaussian and double gamma. And if you look on the right side and on the shape of it, you will notice that there are a couple of things that change as they go from Gaussian to, to double gamma. And in particular, what happens is in the double gamma, you tend to get a little the, the rising, the, the, the top of the rise is a little higher than the beginning of the, of the descent. And then at the end of the descent, there's this undershoot typically under here, which you do not see in the gamma, gamma in the single gamma function. And indeed, again, our values are our effect size, the beta, our parameter, goes from 267 if you implement the um, double gamma uh, as, a, as, a, as the convolving function um, uh, goes up. Um, variance goes up just a little bit, uh, but our t-test again has gone up. In fact, it has now tripled from the, from the initial sort of blocky boxcar approach. So overall, this is a probably slightly better approach to modeling the brain. But 